Boker Tov, good morning. Welcome to the Aliyah Day. Glad that you're with me this morning. Today, we get, finally get to talk about a really important uh, topic, one that I'm sure we could actually spend multiple Aliyahs on, and that is the subject of kashrut, kosher eating, kosher food. Today, we're going to dive into more of the, um, the, the purpose and meaning behind kosher food food and how and kosher eating the overall <clears throat> the overarching laws regarding kosher eating kosher preparation kosher utensils and those kinds of things is referred to as um kashrut so you might hear that term kashrut kosher um you, you probably you may have you may hear it pronounced ka- kashrush because the uh in in hebrew it's kashrut but in Ashkenazi dialect, they they turn the, the the T sound into an S sound, so so it's kashrus or kashrus. Uh, kashrut is actually yeah more you know proper. Uh, but anyway, that's what it's referring to. You might hear the phrase, "Have you koshered your kitchen? Uh, have you koshered those dishes? Uh, those are you know obviously that means have you done what's necessary to make them uh, fit for use and that type of thing." Uh, with respect to eating kosher, eating kosher uh, biblically, uh, religiously, means that you're actually eating things that are certified kosher. The animal, with with respect to mammals uh, and fowl for that matter, that the animal has been properly slaughtered, therefore it's not trefa. Uh, separation of meat and dairy is absolutely biblical. It is 100% Torah law. It is a settled matter. I want to emphasize that. Uh, there's many non-Jews who wonder about it and so forth. Of course, again, I want to say uh, that uh, it, a, a lot of people make a big deal about meat and dairy separation. You have to ask yourself why. Why is it such a big deal? Why do you have to have a cheeseburger? Like, why is it such a big deal that? Oh my God! If I don't, if I don't set, if I don't mix meat and cheese together, I'm not sure I could live. Um, why fight it? But the point, in fact, is, is that meat and dairy separation is a matter of biblical law, not oral law. It's not rabbinic tradition. I want to emphasize that fact. This is a settled matter. It's been settled for thousands and thousands of years. OK, um, there was there was no dairy offerings in the temple for a reason, uh, because it was essentially a meat restaurant. And so this issue of kosher involves meat and dairy separation. It's very important. Uh, it involves, um, you know, utensils and so forth. Now, there's a misnomer in that if you have a kosher kitchen, it means you have to have two refrigerators, two ovens, two dishwashers. That's not true. If you can have that, great. If you can have a, you know, I mean, there are people who uh, are are blessed financially, and therefore they can actually have two kitchens in their home. Yeah, that's true. I mean, uh, it's it's not exactly common, but I have heard of people who, you know, are blessed financially and they actually have a meat kitchen and a dairy kitchen, uh, full kitchens. Um, you know, that's great. If you can do that, Hey, that's wonderful. Okay. Um, but you know, that's not by no means required. And you have to understand, you know, when I hear people say, uh, well, to have a kosher kitchen, you have to have two dishwashers and two refrigerators and so forth. Uh, obviously such people have never lived in the Jewish communities. Um, not everybody in the Jewish community has space for that type of thing, right? So the idea you have to have that is simply not true. There are some people, by the way, who have decided because they don't want to mess with it, that they don't eat meat at their house, um, that their home is a parv, dairy, you know, vegetarian only, pisca- uh, uh, fish only, whatever uh, place, because you can have fish and cheese together. And so people have made that decision. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with that either. Uh, that, I mean, if that's the way you want to do it, then that's fine. They just kind of eliminate the, eliminate it altogether. Uh, and if they have uh, meat, then they only eat it, you know, at a kosher restaurant or, or somebody else's house, <laughs> but not theirs because they don't want to, they don't want to mess with it and so forth. And, that, and that's all, that's all well and good. So today we're going to be discussing this topic. The The bottom line is, is that, um, let me say something. Well, first of all, let me say something that ex- w- w- will be considered extremely shocking to most people. And I would venture to guess 
even people who are in Lapid Judaism, because you're not supposed to say this kind of stuff. It's it's this is taboo. What I'm about to say, it's it's not. It's it's it's. Wow, I can't even believe you said it out loud. Uh, so let me say it out loud. Eating pork is a sin. Yes, just as bad as homosexuality or theft or robbery or whatever. Wait, what? <laughs> yeah, eating shrimp is a sin. Yes, it is. Mixing meat and dairy together is also a sin. I said sin with an S. Chait with a chait. Um, you know, they say don't be a hater. A hater is somebody who's a sinner. Don't be a hater. So, um, yeah, I mean, you know, eating catfish is a sin. Now, me saying it like that, is it am I correct in that even for those of you who believe in kosher eating, even me saying it, just be honest with me. Maybe maybe I'm wrong. And, and if I am, that's fine too. But uh does that even sound shocking to your ears? Why? If it's true, why? Because we've been mentally conditioned that, you know, eating is a personal choice and it's not exactly spiritual and God doesn't really care. He kind of kind of cares, but not really care. And so we don't like this. And we didn't, and, and, and we generally, most people are very wishy-washy in the way that they think. They don't like to have hard, um, you know, one way or the other beliefs, okay? Uh, and that's because, now I, I'm getting way off into psychology here, but bear with me for a moment. Um, that's because most people are mentally conditioned that you want to be likable. Uh, and not that we don't want to be likable. I mean, that's not really, that should never be a goal. Um, I don't really, I, like Rebecca talked about yesterday, Telling somebody I don't have a filter or I just say what I, what comes to mind, that's not a good midot, midot. That's not a good character trait to have. So if that's you and you're the, that person who doesn't have a filter, you need to, you need to find a filter, okay? Because, um, you know, and that's why you have so few friends, if, if that's you. So uh, is because people don't, that's not okay. Uh, but at the same time, people don't want to say eating pork is a sin because they don't really want to offend anybody because they want people to like you. Um, and I get it. But the fact of the matter is eating, eating bacon, eating pork chops, eating a ham sandwich is a sin. Same thing could apply to shrimp, to lobster, to crawfish, to catfish, to shark, uh, to a cheeseburger. Okay. It's a sin. Okay. It is the opposite of sanctification. It's the opposite of holiness. We're going to dive into why these things are so important. What, but, but food Okay, so food is, you know, is important like all the other commandments, because the same God who said, you know, uh, love your neighbor is the same God who said, don't eat a ham sandwich, um, which is interesting because how many of you know, just historically, that Jews were forced to convert to Christianity and part of that conversion forcefulness was literally to eat like a ham sandwich. Isn't that interesting? So, uh, and Isaac and Yigal has pointed out before, what is it that the pagans, whenever they want to desecrate the temple, what do they always, 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 always do? And that was to offer a pig on the altar. So, that and to do that was actually a blasphemy against Hashem, of course. That was a, you know, a slap in the face to the God of Israel, clearly. Okay. So, just... Let those things kind of sink in. If you're, I'm, I'm really, right now, I'm talking to the person who's new and you're trying to figure this out, whether or not we're not cases or not, we're not, but you're trying to figure it out, which is great. You should figure that out. Um, and you're thinking to yourself, I don't know, is it really like, you know, is it really a sin? Yes, it is. Okay, well, and, and now I'm kind of explaining why it's so bad. But anyway, the point is that food actually takes it to a, a, a higher level, actually. So as it turns out, not only is what we eat important, not only does it matter, it's the same God who gives all the commandments. These are same, these are commandments from the same God. But as we're going to learn, food actually is a prerequisite for becoming holy, for becoming in tune 
with the divine. In other words, if you're not eating kosher, you're going to have, it's not impossible, but you're going to have an extremely difficult time uh, learning Torah. But anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself. I have a lot I want to say on this topic. I want to mention uh, Acts 15. Um, my opinion about Acts 15, uh, and it's not just my opinion, but it's also the opinion of other, of other scholars, is that it never happened. It was a make-believe story. Uh, the book of Acts is all a propaganda piece for uh, Paul, um, and therefore it's, it's fraught. Yes, I said fraught. It's fraught with issues. Uh, but Acts 15 never happened. Um, however, I do believe that elements of Acts 15 with respect to what the apostles, the real ones, were teaching to non-Jews who wanted to come into the faith, I think that elements of that were true. The event itself never happened. It's a made-up story. I, I, I don't want to spend too much time saying why, um, but it is. Uh, but I do believe that some of the things they were saying was, in fact, true because it's things that Jews still do today when they talk to non-Jews who want to come into the covenant. So we'll talk about that today as well. But let me say good morning. Good morning to Devorah. Thank you for being here, Devorah. Good morning, Lori. Hope you're doing fantastic. And good morning, Ahava. And good morning, Peaches. Uh, good morning, Kristen. Hope you're doing fantastic as well. Good morning, uh, Realm Warrior there in Western Virginia. Good morning, Clayton. Helena, Arkansas. John, hope you're having a great day. Ariella, good morning to you, ma'am. Shoshana Brenner. Hope the goats are doing well. They, the, her goats are in a protected area. Uh, good morning, Lori, meaning they can't be uh, used for food. Good morning, Marita. Hope you're doing great. Chris, Crystal, hope life is treating you well. Uh, Yaakov Keith, good morning, sir. Nellie Grace, hope life is uh, blessing you today. Roy, good morning, Roy. And good morning, Zaykin and Yagal. And good morning, uh, who else do we have? Smiley, good morning. Um, Good morning, uh, Shoshana Keith. Hope you're doing great. Milka, good morning. Uh, let's see. Uh, first first Love Club, good morning. Haniel, good morning. And uh, who else? Who else? Yeshai, good morning. Hope you and Adeya are doing great and being richly blessed. Uh, Ami, good morning. Lynn, good morning. Kathy, hello to you, ma'am. Uh, who else do we have? Sergio, good morning, Sergio. Yeah, Marita, I love fish tacos too. That those are those are really really good. Uh, who else do we have? Who else do we have? My little thing. I should have used my phone. Good morning, Sarah Duncan. Good morning, Makaya. Makaya, excuse me. <laughs> Hope you're doing fantastic, fantastic as well. Naomi, good morning, and hello to Levi and Willie and Amana and Kelly Allard. Look at all these precious souls. Michelle, good morning, Michelle. Uh, good morning, Sarah Merritt. How about that? Once again, good morning. Uh, so my little my little thing jumped. I should have used my phone. So yesterday I missed some people. It really bothers me when I when I miss your name. Uh, did I say good morning to you, Brenda? I hope I did. Um, who else do we have? Just really quickly moving through the list. All these wonderful people. And one of our bigger problems is it's a problem I like to have is we have so many people watching live. Sometimes it's hard to. Uh, you know, say hello to him. Oh, by the way, Shoshana Keith says the word Shoshana Keith wrote and said the word calls pork as well as homosexuality an abomination. That's a great point. And, and Shoshana, I'm glad you you said that because I was thinking it a, a moment ago. And then I, I got distracted thinking about something else. But the thing about kosher eating with respect to pork, I think in Deuteronomy 14, it also talks about this with respect to shellfish that the same word that is used for homosexuality being an abomination, which, by the way, is a word that is used with respect to idolatry, is also used about non-kosher food. So in other words, there's a connection. And it's an interesting connection because it's a connection that is seemingly unique to these concepts. And that is that um, homosexuality, idolatry, and non-kosher food have a connection. Now think about that for a moment. How many of you, how many, now listen, just, just, you know, what, look, not everybody agrees, but let's just put it out there, right? How many people that believe in Hashem, whether they're Christian or not, are, are opposed to homosexual, homosexuality. They, they believe that based on the scriptures, 
which ironically, those scriptures they're basing it on is part of the law of Moses, which they reject, but put that aside. They believe that homosexuality is wrong. It's a sin. Okay, fine. But yet they don't think that eating pork is a sin or eating shrimp is a sin, right? And I, and I would venture to guess that those same people probably think idolatry is a sin as well, although they practice it every day. But again, putting that aside, so, you, but you see the connection. So this is how the Satan will mess you up. He'll say, well, you don't, you don't want to participate in, in, in sin, sin number one over here. Do you? Well, no, that's an abomination. That's terrible. Oh, okay. Well here, eat up, eat a ham sandwich. Okay. And little, but you, he knows something you don't know. And that is that in the heating, the eating the ham sandwich, you're basically committing the same infraction just in a different way. Does that sound comforting to you? I mean, really, it's disgusting, isn't it? It should be disgusting. And, and I want you to feel that it's disgusting because it is. Um, did I miss anybody? Good morning, uh, Mati Yahoo. Look at Mati Yahoo this morning. He's able to join us. And Leah, good morning to you. Yosef, good morning. Karen Bristol. Bristow. Karen Bristow from Dothan, Alabama. Good morning, Karen. And good morning, Vania. Vania, good morning to you as well. Looks like uh, you're there this morning. That's great. Joe, good morning to you. And Beverly Cantu, good morning, Hannah. Good morning, Hannah. Hope you're doing great. Uh, and Kathy Castaneda, good morning to you. So yeah, I hope, hope everybody, if, listen, if I missed you, it's never, never intentional. It's just uh, my thing doesn't always cooperate with me over here. So anyway, I hope you're doing great. Let's dive into this topic. We're going to look at Vayikra chapter 11 from Rabbi Monk's commentary. Uh, the whole point of eating kosher is being holy. Now, I mentioned Acts 15. Just let me say this really quickly. Acts 15, that event, I don't think ever happened. Um, it was The book of Acts was written um, a long, long, long time after Paul was dead. Paul, in his met the letters he actually wrote, uh, he never mentioned the Acts 15 council ever, not one time, um, which as historians and scholars have brought up is very peculiar because if Acts 15 had actually happened, um, that would have seemingly solved a lot of the conflict that Paul was having with the other apostles. Well, by the way, did you do you realize, and just, I, I know I've said this before, but just as an aside, Paul's opponents were actually other believers. Think about that for a moment. And not just other believers, but other apostles and their students. Think about that for a minute. Paul's opponents, he says so himself because he talks about the other gospels. Paul's opponents were not non-believing Jews. Paul's opponents were Peter and James and John, Matthew, and their Talmudim. Think about that for a moment. It's a, it's a historical fact, believe me. Now, putting that aside, Acts 15 didn't happen. But what is interesting in Acts 15 is two of the four, two of the four commandments, if you will, given to the non-Jews who are wanting to come in. This is their prerequisite, okay? Two of the four have to do with kosher eating. One is don't eat blood. And two is don't eat meat strangled. What does that mean, meat strangled? It means don't eat trefa meat. What does trefa mean? Trefa is a word that literally means torn. And it refers to um, meat that has not been properly slaughtered. Properly meaning... Biblically, meaning rabbinically. Now, meat strangled is another such euphemism because, you know, you can't, you know, nobody can strangle a cow to death. OK, or for that matter, a goat. I guess you could maybe a goat, but probably not. But why would you want to do that? that? That's sick anyway. But it doesn't matter. The point I'm trying to make is that it's a euphemism, just like trefa. Trefa means torn. But you're not really going to tear an animal to death, are you? Of course you're not. Um, so that's, again, it's another euphemism for meat that has not been properly, um, slaughtered. Now, Acts 15 didn't happen, but what I do believe is that the writer, this is my opinion, it's my theory, that the writer of Acts who was making stuff up, um, knew that this was in fact a prerequisite that the real apostles were giving to Gentiles, that if you want to come into the community, the first thing you have to do is, you know, what, turn from idolatry, which includes sexual sin, okay, because a lot of the idolatrous cults involve that, 
And the other thing you have to do is start eating kosher. Now, why did they tell the Gentiles that? And by the way, that's essentially, that's pretty much what Gentiles are told today when they're wanting to come in to a Jewish group, right? You basically stop being an idolater. That's number one. You have to turn away from all your idolatry, which would include anything that goes along with that. Okay. Sexual sin or whatever. And you have to start eating kosher. Why? Why? Because eating kosher actually opens up our neshama to receive Torah truth. Okay. Now, I know that a lot of people don't, they have a hard time wrapping their head around that. By the way, I haven't even read through, I haven't had time to read through the uh, chat, but I, I, don't, I, I can't, I didn't see if anybody agreed with me whether or not saying that pork was, a, eating pork was a sin was shocking or not. Maybe you did, and I just haven't seen it yet, but anyway. But people are, have been conditioned, mentally conditioned, you know, to believe that, you know, uh, food is very trivial. Uh, but it's not. Hashem dedicated two whole chapters in the Torah to what we can and can't eat. Two whole chapters, okay, to what we can and cannot eat. Why did he do that? And by the way, is, is it true or not true that Adam and, and Hava, death was brought into the world because they violated a food law? In other words, what we eat and what we don't eat, going all the way back to the garden, has significant effect on our life. It does. So somehow, for some reason, God ordained, Hashem ordained, that what we consume has a profound spiritual effect. That's why I say it's soul food. It has a profound spiritual effect on the person. Therefore, if you are not eating kosher, you, we wonder all the time, if you're not eating kosher, you're going to have a hard time getting these concepts. Let me finish my sentence. Uh, sometimes I interrupt myself and, and it's a bad habit. Think about all these people out there that you and I converse with and and we wonder. Yeah, see, Yishai said, it's not shocking at this point, but five years ago, it would have been shocking. I, I agree with you, Yishai. I, I think that's an honest assessment. But think about all these people that we, you and I talk to on a daily basis and we're we're stunned that they can't seem to understand very logical, very rational, black and white facts. It's like, you know, how can you not see this? This is so obvious. And, and look, the list goes on. The conversation you and I have with people, and I don't know about you, but sometimes I have to walk away because I'm so frustrated that I, I'm I'm like talking to a brick. Like how how can you not see that this is I it's I uh, well the answer is ladies and gentlemen it's what they're eating. <laughs> I know I know that sounds like what you can't be serious right now, but I am serious. It is. They are constantly consuming bacon and pork and trefa meat and shrimp and lobster, and all that garbage, and it is blocking their neshama. It's blocking their neshama from being able to receive from the Ruach HaKodesh. Absolutely. Doesn't mean that God can't get through to them, okay? But it means that it's extremely difficult. Now, let's look at here. It says, he, he um, this is from Vayikra 11. Leviticus 11 and Deuteronomy 14 are the two chapters that have to do with kosher eating. Okay. It says, neither the traditional sources nor the later commentators fully explain the transition from the preceding chapters concerning sacrificial service to those dealing with dietary laws. We just, we just suddenly change gears. We go from sacrifices and not David and Vihu being offered up as a, we talked about that yesterday, as a sanctification offering, essentially. And all of a sudden, next thing you know, we're talking about food. Well, everything in the Word of God has spiritual importance. So what's the spiritual reason we go from sacrifices and the inauguration of the tabernacle to now what we eat? Well, one reason is because we are the living temple. And therefore, what we bring into this temple is just like that which we would bring into the tabernacle and the temple. In fact, 
one will notice that all the animals that we, that we can eat and that we must slaughter in a kosher way, they are all the animals that were offered upon the altar in the temple. Now, there are some kosher animals that are wild and, and, and they're kosher to eat, but we, they were not offered on the altar, okay? Such as deer and, you know, you know, antelope or whatever, and, and giraffe, you know, which happens to be Yaakov Keith's favorite giraffe, barbecue giraffe. He, that's why he has such a big grill. But um, you'll notice that the food actually is the same. So there is a, a, a correlation between the temple and then us, right? But it goes on to say here, the most plausible explanation comes from a discussion in the Talmud in Barakot 55a where it says, Rabbi Yochanan and Rabbi Eliezer said, in the days of the temple, the altar brought forgiveness to Israel. Now the family table brings forgiveness. So this is really intriguing because it's meaning here that there is a connection between eating kosher and making teshuva. Eating kosher and making teshuva. Now, Again, that may sound shocking. Like, what does eating something have to do with receiving forgiveness? Remember, teshuva is, is about making things right. It's about, teshuva is not just about getting forgiveness and saying, I'm sorry, but it's about, uh, it's about correcting past behavior. So in other words, by us eating kosher, we are necessarily rectifying that mistake that Adam and Eve made in the garden. By us not eating kosher, we are necessarily, day by day, continually remaking that same mistake. In other words, we're continuing to eat that fruit given to us by the serpent. We are continuing to per per perpetuate uh, the sin of Adam, and therefore Hashem is no longer walking with us in the, in the cool of the evening. Why? Because we ate something we're not supposed to, right? He doesn't even know where we are. He said, Hashem showed up and said, Eka, where are you? Not like he didn't know where um, where Adam and Eve were, because he's God, he knows everything. But he was saying, how could this happen? I don't know you anymore. This is the same thing that Messiah is going to say to those who who openly and knowingly and willfully reject the law of Moses. He said so in Matthew chapter seven, he says, you know, I'm going to show up and you're going to say, oh, hey, look, I'm so glad to see you. I love you. You're so amazing. And, and he's going to say, I don't know who you are, Aka. Who are you? I don't know you. Okay. So <clears throat> it goes on to say that the fact that the sanctification of the Jewish home begins with the dietary laws, see, that's where sanctification begins. It begins with kosher. Okay. It says here in Sidra Mishpatim, after dealing with judicial and social laws, the Torah proclaims its holy ideal. Kodesh tiyon li. You shall be a holy people for me. The Torah begins the prescription for achieving this ideal with the prohibition against eating meat that is trefa. Okay. In other words, not properly slaughtered. And it, and it, and here Rabbi Monk says, you know, re re refer back to the commentary from uh, Exodus 22 and verse 30. So let's look at that. We're going to turn back to Exodus 22 and verse 30. Um, it says, people of holiness shall you be to me. You shall not eat flesh of an animal that was torn in the field to the dog. You shall throw it away. Now, I've said before that people that, you know, start out trying to do the right thing. They don't know what they don't know. They're usually learning. And listen, we've been there. This is where I started because I didn't know what I didn't know. No one was teaching me. Um, and that is that you start out just trying to eat, quote unquote, clean. Like you stop eating pork, you stop eating shellfish, stop eating catfish, and you start going to the store and you, you, know, you only eat beef or chicken or lamb or whatever. Um, and that's good. That's good because you're starting to, to like, 
you know, head that direction. But I want to emphasize to you that that is not eating kosher and you're still eating meat that's trefa. And as a result, it's still blocking your nashama to a certain extent. And so if that's you, I'm glad that you've, you've, I'm glad that's the direction you've headed. And that's good. It's good that you're doing that. But I want to encourage you, strongly encourage you to, to move into real kosher eating. Now, by the way, I want to say something else that popped into my head as I was saying that. And it was for something that when I was having coffee with the Zakens this week, something that I think it was Zaken Rayford brought up. He reminded me of something I've said before that I forgot I said it, but now I'm going to tell you that I remembered it. <laughs> Thanks to him. That makes sense. So, and that is, he was talking about the websites for Chabad and Aish, right? You go to particularly Chabad, which they have a great website. And one day I pray that we can, you know, emulate it. Um, but a lot of people will go to Chabad and they'll see, or Aish, and they'll see um, their how to light candles, how to kosher your kitchen, how to how to pretty much do anything. And it's it's a great resource with respect to the basics of that, okay? You do have to be careful a little bit as a Lapidnik because, you know, the, the halakha can be a little bit different. And so you always need to check with me um, about, you know, if you have any questions. But putting that aside, um, I, what I wanted to say, what Zakin Rayford reminded me of is that people, you when you go to that and you see like how to light candles, how to say the blessing over bread or wine or how to do Havdalah, you know, whatever. What you may not realize is that as a non-Jew, because most of you who go there are not Jewish by birth, you're wanting to go through conversion here at Lapid, which is amazing. But you may not realize that that website is not for you. <laughs> it's not It's not for non-Jews. Chabad did not create that website which they spent millions on, I'm sure. And they did not, Haish did not create their website for non-Jewish people. Are you aware of that? It's for Jewish people. It's not for non-Jews. They're not there trying to reach the non-Jewish world at all, I promise you, okay? They don't really, I don't want to say they don't care about non-Jews, but they kind of don't. And the reason I want to bring that up is because I want you to understand that there are millions of Jews out there that don't know anything about this stuff, just like you don't. In other words, they're learning just like you're learning. I promise you. I promise you. Okay? I need you to understand that. And, and I want you to understand it from a point of encouragement. Your, your Jewish neighbor probably doesn't, you know, who's not practicing probably doesn't know how to light the candles or you probably know how to light the candles more than they do. I'm just saying, okay. It's, I'm just putting it out there, but I think it's a good point to remember. So going back to Exodus chapter 22 and verse 30, the commentary says, people of holiness shall you be to me. From the very beginning, the ideal of holiness has been assigned to the children of Israel as the supreme goal of their covenant with Hashem. You shall be to me a kingdom of ministers and a holy nation. Isn't that interesting? Holiness is supposed to be the goal. It's supposed to be the goal. This ideal transcends even the practice of justice and love of others. The latter ideal is valid as the ultimate goal for the nations of the world in general, but it does not suffice for the people of Hashem. Our Messianic uh, website, or, uh, excuse me, our Messianic Mission website, think about the Chabad website, their Messianic Mission requires an existence that is completely sanctified and raised to a high level of spirituality, scrupulous morality, mental and physical purity, and self-discipline throughout every moment. Holiness is not an abstract ideal. It is the sovereign principle that commands the lives of men, women, and children. This should not be a complicated topic, okay? In Judaism, to when you enter the covenant, you're held to a very high, a much higher standard. You don't get to, uh, you don't get to 
determine your menu. You don't get to determine uh, what you wear or what holidays you celebrate. But in, see, in the other faith system, it's all up to you. Eat what you want, wear what you want, do what you want, whatever you want to do, it's all up to you. Now, even in the Hebrew Roots movement, which is just an offshoot of Christianity, now the calendar is up to you. You get to choose your own calendar. You get to figure it out for yourself. You even get to choose. I mean, not only do you get to choose the holidays you keep, now you get to keep. You get to choose when you keep them. I mean, it's crazy. But in Judaism, it's not up to us. We have to live by the code of Torah. And I think about, it's an easy example, Look, just to give common sense to this conversation. Our daughter is in ROTC. She's in college. She has, she has a dress code. Even when she uh, is not in her uniform on campus, she just can't dress however she wants to dress. She told us. She said, I'm not allowed to wear this, that, or the other. I have to dress a certain way when I'm in civilian clothes, when I go to class, and so on and so forth. And you know what? You know why? Because she's an officer in the Navy. An officer candidate. She's a midshipman, right? That's why. And if she was just a student, okay, whatever. You're just a student. Dress what you want, the way you want. But here's the kicker. You can eat what you want, but you're also not in the covenant. You can dress how you want, but you're also not an officer in the Navy. So if you're going to be an officer, if you're going to be a midshipman, then you bet you're going to you have to carry yourself a certain way, right? It, it, we, now, when I tell people that in the in the secular world, they're like, "Yeah, of course, make, makes total sense." Yeah, duh, of course. But then when I say to them, "So this is how God wants you to live. He wants you to eat this, eat that, and, you know, blah blah," and they're like, "Oh no, 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 God doesn't care." Wh what? What? So but why can't they get it because their neshama is blocked by the pork chop they have a pork chop blockage so it says hence this verse interrupts the series of laws of justice and morality and in the same context stresses a dietary prohibition which is the com consumption of just any flesh particularly that that's been torn trefa in other words regular grocery store meat in other words ladies and gentlemen that what this is such a great sentence I just read because it's talking about parasha mishpatim and in mishpatim you have all these judgments on morality and justice and due process and the Torah interrupts all of that and says by the way you, you need to not eat meat that's been trade that's trefa in other words what I'm trying to say is and what the commentator is saying here is that Hashem puts eating what we eat in the same context of justice and mercy and love and so forth. So people out there are like, oh, all God cares about is justice and mercy and loving your neighbor. I agree. And that includes what we eat. See, what you don't understand or may not understand is that eating kosher is a part of justice, mercy, love, and so forth. Isn't that interesting? It's true because it's a part of what God said in his holy word with respect to eating kosher. What we eat is a big part of love and justice and mercy. Now, a lot of people will push back on this and say, no, no, no. And the gospels, you know, Yeshua made clear that it doesn't matter what you eat because it goes in the body and out the, out the side. Of the, but that's not true. He wasn't talking about kosher food or non-kosher food in context. And I've taught about this already, but in context, he was talking about whether or not if you eat bread with un ceremonially unwashed hands, if that makes you impure? And the answer to that question is no, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. But if you eat a pork chop or you eat a lobster tail, it will make you impure. Well, how do we know that? Because the Bible says so. And it will, it will, it will jam up your neshama. Now, listen, I knew that this conversation was far too rich and far too deep 
to just have one Ali. We're already nearly 40 minutes into this. So here's what I'm going to do. I was going to talk about something else tomorrow, but I'm not going to talk. I'm going to push that back a week. And I'm going to come back tomorrow. We're going to talk about soul food again on Shabbat because this topic is too important. I have too many pages, literally pages of commentary that I want to share with you about the topic of eating kosher. It's too important. And it's it's why it's one of the prerequisites for those who come in because um, and it's the big it's the, one of the big lies of the Satan. Right. From the from the garden, eat what you want. It doesn't matter. And the reason God doesn't want you to eat this stuff is because he don't want you to be like him. So the Satan has been lying about food since day one. And he lied about it in a bunch of letters that were put into the Christian Bible. And he's still lying about it today. So this is this topic is obviously important to him. It's important to him so much that he raised up a false apostle and had him write some letters to lie about it. So if it's so important to the Satan that he doesn't want you to eat kosher, it must mean that it's an important topic. We're going to cover that tomorrow on the Drosh. End of our Aliyah today. We've got more to talk about. We are simply out of time, never out of content. I could actually probably do two Droshes on this, maybe three. There's so much content. But listen, thank you for being here. Thank you for being here all week. I am glad that you are here with me. It is a blessing for all of you to be here. If you enjoy these, these uh, topics, if you enjoy Lapid Judaism, it means something to you. Please be sure and donate to our, our organization, our ministry. You can find in the description of every video ways that you can give. And for if you're a member of, uh, of Lapid Judaism, we're asking everybody to be tithing members. Um, I'm going to challenge everybody to be tithers. But if you like these programs and you're not yet committed to Lapid Judaism, you soon will be. Huh? Resistance is futile. <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, if you enjoy it, um, please donate. We, we need your support to continue doing what we do. I want to see everybody in the shul tomorrow. If you've been joining us online, please be sure and be here tomorrow. We'll be in the synagogue, 1030 Central Standard Time. I'm going to continue this conversation about soul food, and uh, it's going to be a blessing, I pray. I love you. I bless you. I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Until then, have a great day, a great prep day. Shabbat Shalom to every one of you.